Thank you, thank you. Um, first of all, I want, I'm Elizabeth Field. Thank you for joining me today in my conversation about period and modern instruments. And I want to thank Jackie and Bill for um, giving me this opportunity. I think this is an experiment for them because I've come here twice with my husband and we've played concerts and it's been just really fun. And on the last concert I played, I played a piece by Heinrich Bieber. And uh, it was written in the end of the 17th century. And I talked a little bit about the violin. I used actually my modern violin and I used a period bow. So I talked a little bit about that and Jackie and Bill had the idea that maybe I could come and give a little bit of a lecture demonstration or a presentation just what is the difference between period and modern instruments and what does it mean to play them and how does it affect myself as a performer. So that's really what this presentation is about. Um, Matt, before I forget, I want to remember, I want to remind you that you may um, donate very easily to these concerts and I think there's a donate button and I'll try and remember to ask for that again at the end. So um, just to give you a little background of who I am. So I was um, a modern violin student in the end of the 20th century. I will not give you an exact date. And I was taught with very standard traditional conservatory pedagogy. I had wonderful iconic violin teachers. I studied with Joseph Silverstein, Oscar Shumsky, David Nadian. These were violinists who were steeped in this incredible 20th century violin language that we all love. It's what we hear in um, on all of our classic recordings. It's David Oistrakh. It's this style of playing, and I just adore that style of playing. So um, that was my background. The only thing is I felt as a student, and I think this is where the seed was planted, I really kind of understood much more quickly how the music worked with anything written after about 18, 20, or 30. The music in the 18th century, I would work very hard. I would try and play it as well as I could, and there was always something that bothered me, and I didn't know what it was. So as a young professional, I was completely rocked. It rocked my world when I finally found out the truth, and this was not my opinion, it was that all these composers in the 18th century, my favorite ones, Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, even Mozart, Haydn, even the young Beethoven, played and composed their music for an instrument that was completely different. It sounded different, it was played different, it was a completely different instrument than the one I had learned to play all their music on. So it's kind of one of those things you can't unsee. You know, it didn't matter, and this was sort of what it was my first insight into this early music movement. And um, it didn't matter whether I liked the sound of them or not. That wasn't really the issue that nagged. The nagged is, what nagged at me is that there were things I needed to learn. I needed to understand why these composers made the kind of choices that they did. Because compositionally, they wrote things down on a piece of paper, and that's all we have 200 years later. And surely, even if I didn't like the way those instruments sounded, Mr. Bach and Mr. Handel didn't say, well, you know what, in 1720, this isn't going to sound very good. But you just wait, in 250 years, it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. So clearly, they made choices for the instruments at hand. And I wanted to know what that was and why and how did it affect the music. So uh, this also then put me head to head with this conundrum. Because it seemed really clear to me that what, I was ta what we were talking about was two different languages. There was a language going on in the 18th century which involved a different medium. And clearly it was going to have an effect on notation and some of the things I'm looking at on a page. I'm reading this page. And we have to remember that you know, the page of music is not music. The page of music is no more music than a recipe is food. It's simply an instruction sheet. It's our job to read those dots on the page and somehow translate that into some musical vision. And as a student, we've all been taught uh, the goal was to realize the composer's intention. This was kind of a mantra that we all understood that this was our job. So the conundrum that you come up with is, OK, I realize I'm playing music that was written in a different language. I have two choices. I can, and this is what happened for 250 years, translate that music into a contemporary vernacular. And that has a lot of credibility, because now 
the essence of that music is being projected to a modern audience and that will have an impact on them, whereas in the original version, maybe it wouldn't have the same. And in fact, it's very funny, on my way over here, I was listening to the radio and they were talking about um, performances of Sherlock Holmes. And apparently there's a new movie and people are upset because the new Sherlock, the older people are upset because the new Sherlock Holmes is using an iPhone. <laughs> but the kids think that's great. So that, in fact, is a microcosm of what historical performance practice is. So the movie industry, you're talking about Sherlock Holmes. Should they reproduce it, Sherlock Holmes, in 1898 or in, in 2021? So it's the same issue. So the other choice that we have, and these are sort of broad choices, there's a lot of nuance within these choices, obviously. The other choice is that I go back and learn that other language as fluently as I can so that I can really understand it and then play that in that language and hopefully that will convey the meaning of the music. And, this is, and when I say the meaning of the music, I'm really talking about the expression. And in the 18th century, they really understood this difference between execution and expression, and they talk about it all the time. By the way, where did they talk about it? They wrote tons and tons of books. They didn't have YouTube, they didn't you know, go to the movies, didn't have TV, they just wrote books about how to do things. And all in different languages throughout the 200 years from 1600 to 1800, there's tons and tons of treatises. Different languages, different times. And of course, they're all slightly different, but you find in all of these different treatises there are certain kinds of commonalities of usage, kind of like studying how English was used for those 200 years. So anyway, um, you go and looking at those treatises, that would be your first source of let's try and kind of decipher that code, which is what I was gung-ho to do when I was a young musician, and I went, Cornell University had a fantastic program, 18th century historical performance practice, yippee. And so I went there and read all these books and learned everything I could about period instrument performance. And to get back to my other point, one of the things that you see written all the time is this distinction between execution and expression. And that turns out to be a really, really important divide because execution is the practicality of how you do something. It's the medium. It's how you, for the violin, it's how you pull the bow how you make the sound, how does the instrument work. And we can quantify and codify that, and that's easy for them to write about, and they do. They write in great depth about how to do things. The expression, of course, is much more elusive because, and in fact, that's the goal of all of us as musicians and performers. There's no other goal, is that we're trying to be expressive. And it's hard to describe that in words for a good reason because music, in my mind, is the story where the words, the music starts where the words stop. That's why we sing and play instruments and do all this stuff. So I thought as I got older and was getting more comfortable playing my period violin, I started, started to think, you know, I still loved the way David Oistrock played Bach. I still loved all those old recordings. You can't just be dismissive of that great artistry. And so what I was saying is that expression, I didn't want to lose. I didn't want to lose the voice of my modern instrument either. So the lifelong goal was, can I learn as much I can about the old language and then translate the execution to my modern violin that can then project the expression? It's a little bit abstract, but I think after we go through some of these exercises, you'll understand what I was talking about. So that's kind of the setup. And tonight, what I'm going to do is take you through a couple of the processes that I did as a violinist myself. And um, later on, you'll see, I'll take the same music, some little excerpts from Solo Bach, and we start with a 20th century version. I go back to what I learned on the Baroque violin, and then go back to the modern violin. So that's the game. Is it possible? Can we do this? Can it be done? So let's start at the beginning. First, let's clarify what these instruments are. What is the difference between a Baroque and a modern violin? So I have two here, and you have in your first hand, I think you can see it up here. Um, these are the two instruments. And what you'll see, uh, mostly it's about the neck. But I'm going to first just, by a show of hands, I know the people online can't see this, but there's a few people here. Um, this violin, 
which is darker in color, was made in 1703. This violin was made in 2007. So by a show of hands, who, how many people think the first one is the Baroque violin? And OK, everybody's too smart. I can't <laughs> fool you with that trick. So that, that's correct. The modern violin is the one that was made in 1703. The Baroque violin is 2007. This 2007 violin is a copy of an Amati, as it, was, well, as it looked when it was new. And remember, of course, Baroque violins were brand new in 1703. So it looked like this. Amati was Stradivari's teacher. And the, this violin was designed to be, ex, to, its voice is based on resonance. So it was designed to be played in the rooms where music was played in the 18th century, in court, in very acoustic resonant ballrooms, in church, stone walls. Okay, there's a, and that's, you know, that turns out that with this instrument, I really believe that the room, the acoustic, is half of its voice. So when I go into a room, I'm, well, how's, what's, how's my instrument today? And you have to look at everything. In fact, there's a really funny sentiment. There's a guy named Quant who wrote this amazing book on how to play all kinds of music. And he says, what's the first thing, and Margot knows the answer to this, what's the first thing you think of when you're trying to determine the tempo of a piece? And you know, we can ask get all kinds of answers. The answer that he gives you is how many tapestries are on the wall? So if there's a lot of tapestries, you've got less resonance, you've got to play faster. So therefore, the tempo has got to be somewhere down low in terms of kind of ex expressive triage tools. We're looking for all kinds of other things. So anyway, this is the, the Baroque violin. You can see on this, oops, uh-oh. All right, so you can see on my pictures, I don't know if you can see it clearly, the main difference is that this violin has a straight neck and it's got this little wedged fingerboard that creates the entire tension. Has to be on the page. Sorry, what? Point to the other page. What? Okay. All right. So here's this. This is the Baroque fingerboard, and then here's a modern fingerboard. And what happened is that almost all the string instruments in in Europe, at the beginning of the 19th century, went under a modernization process. So what happened is, and we can think how that relates to history, the court system falls and music is going more into the public arena. So now they're playing not so much in these resonant ballrooms, but they're playing in opera houses and in, and in public spaces. Anybody who's been into an opera house in Italy, it's, it's cloth from top to bottom. So par that's part of the thing. The venues are changing. The style of music is playing. People, composers are getting different ideas. So they want the voice to be louder. And that is the first principal distinction you'll hear between the two instruments. One does seem louder than the other. But that came at a price. Because what the modernization process did is I call it open scroll surgery. They cut off the original neck. And you can see here, the neck is at a bigger angle. There's another photograph down here. So they cut the neck off. They opened the violin and put the neck inside the instrument on a block of wood. And then they, basically all the resonating fittings were increased in size, the wood was re-graduated. The instrument became one not that was principally driven by resonance, but one that now could project. So you had to have more tension on the instrument so that you could throw the voice. So of course that meant that the sole of the instrument, which is the bow, also underwent a major design Activity. So here on the next um, handout, these, this is sort of a very basic collection of different bows. And here you have what's called, and I'm showing it in live here, it's a se sort of a 17th century bow. It's pretty, sh and it's pretty short. We have a technical name for it. The, the name is short bow. <laughs> so people don't realize that actually a bow is just a stick of wood that the bow maker carves. So in this case, in these early bows, they left this pointy tip right here. It's called a pike's head. And um, it has a quite, I don't know if you can see this, it has quite a thin um, strip of hair to play on. And it doesn't, the frog, I'll, I'll show it later. I'm not going to do it now because it's hard to put it back in. But this is what's called a clip-in frog. So this, this thing just comes right out, and you stretch the hair over it, and I pull this little piece of leather hair to make the, the hair tight. So this is the short bow. Eventually, they come up with something uh, uh, later in the century. Because remember, we're talking about the 18th century. 
And you remember from music history, the first half is kind of the Baroque period, the second half is the classical period. So this is sort of a later Baroque bow, which is probably the common bow that you're gonna find for most of the music that we play. And this is called the long bow. So it's basically longer. It's kind of the same bow, but all of these changes affect how it plays. And also they invented this screw device so you can tighten and relax the hair. It still has a pretty thin ribbon of hair. Um, by the end of the century, we have tons. Now, there's three of them. There's, there's three versions of these bows. The last three are considered, actually, the, the second, the third, the last, second to last two are considered transitional bows. And that was a free for all. So, the instruments they're trying to project, and they came up with this thing called camber, which is they borrowed it from furniture makers. You could bend the wood. And this allowed you to sink into the instrument, especially when one that had more tension on it. And that was starting to get it this ability to throw the sound. And because of that camber, they had to leave more uh, wood up at the head. That's called a hatchet head. And the frog got bigger. And all of this does, it changes the way, the relationship of the bow to the violin and to the voice of the instrument. And the last thing that you see there is the design by basically that was made by Tort in about 1785. Because up to that point, there was no standardization. Bows were made out of snake wood, iron wood, but, per, but um, Tort said, no, the best wood is Pernambuco. The best weight is this, the best length, I don't even know what it is, but somebody knows. There's a standardized weight and measurement, and he invented this ridiculously tiny thing, which is huge, it's called a ferrule. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a piece of metal that allowed you to spread the hair. So now the, the, the playing surface is a lot, lot bigger. And the frog is very heavy. So this totally changes. So in just 100 years, the entire instrument, even though the bodies look pretty much the same, have changed. So I'm gonna demonstrate, I'm gonna go through the Baroque violin, um, which I remember is on low tension. And because of the low tension, our standard pitch for Baroque music is 415, which is a half step lower than we're used to. So every time I switch instruments, I know this is a little disarming for the ear, but I'm gonna tr I'll try and establish the tonality before I do that. So you, when you hear the same piece of music half step up or down, it won't make you crazy. So, okay, here is um, the Baroque violin. And notice also, the way I play this, I don't put my head on the violin like that. I'm supporting it on my collarbone. We call this chinless playing. So it's basically just supporting here, and I make the sound by pulling the weight of my arm across the strings. So that's the resonance. And now here, this is a pretty good room, but imagine if this was a stone church. It's actually quite huge sounding. So now let me get, that was the short bow from the 17th century. The bow is getting a little longer, same thing. You start to hear a slightly different quality because the bow is heavier. I don't know if that comes through on the, on the uh, zoom. Okay, and now here, this is, this is very close to a modern bow. And I'm now I'm going to be able to sink into the string a little bit. This violin doesn't quite have enough tension for it, but you'll still hear the difference in sound. Okay, then after the modernization process, this violin, which was in 1703, sounded a lot like what I just played, but after it underwent its surgery, First of all, get used to this new pitch. We find they, it, the music starts to change, and a couple things happen. A guy named Spore invented this funny thing in about 1837. It's called a chin rest. And what that did is allowed you to put your vi head on the violin. Essentially, it's now substituting head weight for arm weight. So now my arm feels really different because before the arm was kind of keeping the violin in place. Now, every student learns, the, you know, the very beginning, you have to learn how to hold your violin. And what happened to the sound? I'm now going to be able to dig in. So very 
very different sound. It certainly is a lot louder. And so because it's louder, it seemed to everybody, oh, the instrument's just getting better and better and better. But what happens when you go back and study the performance practice of the time, which used these other instruments, you realize that there was this whole very nuanced palette of expression that was lost because of the price of becoming like a Rolls Royce. So I, I kind of like to say it's the difference between riding on a horse, where you don't get there as fast, but you can actually see all the flowers and stuff. Rolls Royce, boom, you're really there fast. But there's a price. So anyway, it's not, again, this is not a lecture to say better or worse. My, I'm, in an effort, which is pretty hard to do because I am biased, but I'm trying to, as in an objective way as possible, just present, demonstrate, and inform. So, let's now look, let's do the next handout. So one of these guys who wrote treatises is this guy named Michel Corette. In 1738, it's called this huge instructional manual, L'Ecole d'Orfei, and you can get it on IMSLP for free. And he really codifies all of these kinds of basic Baroque techniques, how you do it, and he also talks a lot about style. So I'm gonna just cover some very, very basic rules of, and I don't even like the word rule, but uh, of Baroque technical technique and execution. So we're still on the execution angle. We're still looking, how do I play this and how do I read what's on the page? So I want, I'm gonna take my, go back to my Baroque violin. I'm a student in 1738 and my teacher has assigned me this book from Mr., this page from Mr. Corrette's treatise. Um, okay, and he's talking about all this stuff on top in French. But if you go to the one, two, three, four, fifth exercise, he says, quatre notes de coup d'archet. And that's basically saying four notes in one bow. So he's really talking about a slur. A slur is this funny curved figure here. And on a string instrument, what that means is putting more notes under a single bow string. So without the slur, this would be, but he's saying put four notes on the down bow and put in four notes. Okay, so he's teaching us about the slur. So I'm gonna play exactly what I see on the page and I'm gonna try and play it accurately and correctly. It's in two, four, I understand that that's the same as I've always known. So four notes in a bow. That's pretty accurate. That's basically what the page says. But then my teacher says, well, you really got to know about the rule of the slur. The rule of the slur, and this is something you read, all of these guys talk about it in their own language with their own words, but the essence of the rule of the slur is defined that the first note defines the group of notes under the slur and the rest taper. And I use that English word taper as a translation to what, how I've read that rule. Taper is different than diminuendo. Diminuendo is a musical expressive marking, which really means something. It would be kind of seasick if all the music had these constant diminuendos. But what does it mean that the first note defines it and the other notes taper? Even though in this case, the notes are going up. Well, I realize because, remember I talked that this is a language? In the 18th century, almost all of this music comes from vocal music, which is built on sung and written text, language. So this is all about syntax. You can make an analogy to written language in almost everything you see on this page. So I think what the slur really means is he's defining syllables. And we need to think about syllables and, and think about the expression of spoken and sung text. If I sing or say even the word syllable, that's a three syllable word. Each syllable has more than one letter. I don't go syllable. I don't accent syllable. But the first letter of each one of those syllables defines that syllable, and then I put them together in an expressive way, and that's articulation. So I'm realizing that I think, in fact, these slurs are showing you that the melody note, and remember, that's the other thing about this music, always look for melody. Don't be confused. There's lots of fast notes in this music, but there's always melody, even in the very driven rhythmic stuff, 
whatever. So I think the melody is being shown to us by the first note of each one of these groups. So if I play just the first note of each of these slurred groups, I get this. That's kind of a pretty melody. So it turns out all those other notes under the slur, the tabor means they're kind of the extra letters in the syllable. So now can I be expressive with the melody and play syllables? Now there's nothing on that page that I did now that's different than if I played when I played. And that comes to this whole thing. What's, uh, there isn't very much on the page. The only thing on the page are these fundamental markings, rhythm and pitch and very basic uh, expressive markings. It's all unnotated expression. I need to have the fluency of the language to understand that my expression comes from arching that melody. And the funny thing about grouping notes like that is that because I've created these large packages for the little notes, it frees the little notes to be freer and more expressive. At the same time, I don't distort the rhythm, and I'm able to nuance that melody. Let me play that again and see if I'm going to try and really do something interesting with the melody. <laughs> So again, that's all unnotated, and I have to say I would fail a metronome exam. There is, that is not metronomic. The metronome has no rhythm. But these groupings give the music a fundamental rhythmic foundation, which then allows, and this is really important, it liberates this nuanced um, articulation, which is analogous to the kind of expression you get with the huge palette of expression that you do in sung and spoken text. So, okay, so that's Groupings, of, that's the rule of the slur. Now look at the exercise above it. Here we see three notes slurred and then one with a little extra up bow. So this starts to speak to something. One of the things that this instrument does very nicely and very easily and organically, it likes to just change bows very easily. It's effortless. So when I was a child and learned to play the violin, we learned very dutifully to play down bow and up bow. There's two separate directions. Well, in this music, often those two directions come not from two gestures, but from one gesture. And what does that mean? That means in the same way that you drop a ball on the floor, you drop it once and it rebounds. You get two directions. But it has only one gesture. So this, this and this sound entirely different but they look exactly the same on the page. So this is what we call a tubo gesture. You could also have three bow gestures. So in the same way the slurs can group into syllables, you can also group separate notes into syllables. Because again, we're always trying to find this text. So let's look at this exercise. Since I've already learned about the rule of the slur, and I've decided that the first note of the slur is really the melody, my tubo gesture is from that first note of the slur, and then the rebound is on the last note of the group. So here's my melody. And now if I simply add the rest of the notes, it's like filling out the syllables. point out, I could play as if I didn't know any of those rules, which I didn't when I first looked at this thing, and I would have dutifully played exactly what's on the page, which actually says this from my modern 20th century mind. Okay, so I actually did read exactly on the page, but I don't think that's what Corette meant. So this is this whole game, is how do we read this notation 
And again, I, I'm not demonstrating my modern violin, but both of these things could happen no matter what medium I'm playing on. So we've learned about the rule of the slur, the two, and we call them multiple bow gestures. And also this idea that notes can repeat themselves. It's very easy to play groups of separate notes. So if you look at this next piece, anybody recognize this piece? Right? What's the melody? If I play. That is the equivalent of reading text letter by letter. And that's the way it looks on the page to a 20th century mind that hasn't read any of these books that tell you how to read it. And I think that's why in the 1950s people used the term sewing machine to describe box music. Because if you play all these notes absolutely perfectly written on the page, it does sound like a sewing machine. But if I'm looking at how am I going to group these notes? Okay, we have repeated notes, the melody. And in fact, I have a group now, an eight bow gesture. In that funny thing is in my world as a child, that would have been under a slur. So we have. incredible ebullient quality. So that that made sense to me. That made a lot more sense to me then. Okay, that's repeated notes. Now, the very last little rule of execution that I'm going to talk about is legato. And as I'm talking about, I'm going to go to my modern violin. So legato is basically smooth execution. It's what happens when you sing, right? It's the it's the fundamental of all Arioso music of all singing. It's what the violin loves to do. So in the 19th and 20th century, legato was usually represented by slurs. It ends up being kind of backwards. And I was taught by my teacher, Mr. Shumsky, that when you play a slur, you have to sustain through the whole slur, especially the last note of the slur, because if you want that to project in Carnegie Hall, that's what you have to do. So I'm going to take this is now we're going to my modern violin and we're going to talk about legato. Here's the, here's get to get our ears adjusted. Okay, so this thing that you're looking at is the final chorus of Dido and Aeneas by Purcell. It's really just with drooping wings, ye cupids come. Oh, it's just incredibly moving and beautiful, gorgeous music. When I first played this piece back in, when I was a student, I played it with my modern instruments with a modern orchestra, and the whole thing had been edited to be under slurs. And I played it like this. And as I'm doing it, remar I'm, since I'm going to be playing it on two different instruments, I'm going to go back and forth, I am going to say that the one variable in this experiment is me. So I'm trying to show that actually my phrasing is going to stay the same, the phrasing, which is kind of the heart of the expression despite the medium, the voice, and the language. So here's my 20th century version of the singing um, um, final chorus of Dido and Aeneas. <laughs> about as that's my legato from what I learned as a, a student to my surprise when I started to learn the Baroque violin this is one of the first pieces I had to play and I discovered that the most legato thing I could do is play everything with a separate bow and that was so I'm just going to try and demonstrate that so let's get our ears adjusted <laughs> So 
So that's my, that's, we go. So here's the game. Can I translate that expression to this equipment? And part of the challenge, and I feel this is important, is I don't want to minimize the voice of this instrument. I love the way this violin works. We don't be expressive by means of subtraction. So another thing that you people notice, oh, I see you're vibrating. And that one you don't. I didn't take it away. In fact, this one, the vibrato was added, I think partly one reason it does is to compensate for the lack of resonance but also because of the way we approach this instrument. So I'm gonna, I try and find, this violin was made in 1703 and probably played that piece at some time by some you know, musicians in England or Germany or this violin was actually made in Italy, so probably in Italy. And they played it, it sounded like that violin a lot, it had a Baroque bow. So I try to capture that voice, so I'm gonna release my head weight even from the modern violin, see how much resonance I can use and kind of use the vibrato in a different way to try and compensate for it. So can I do this? been my solution when I'm asked to play, for example, a piece like that in a venue with a group of people who aren't playing Baroque instruments. But I want to give that expression. And that with, a, with an entire section of violins is kind of hauntingly beautiful. Violin. Okay, so I think to finish up this little uh, uh, demonstration of Baroque execution, I'm going to play half of that beaver piece that I played on the last recital. And I'm going to go back to my Baroque violin and my short 17th century bow. So this was written, I think, in 1685 or something like that. It's the prelude, Bieber wrote uh, 15 sonatas representing the mysteries of the rosary. This is the, to represent the Annunciation. And you'll notice, actually, here, just if you wanna see, I won't play off of it, but this is the original. Okay, so all of these black notes, you'll see that represents all separate bows. And if you look, remember we talked about the rule of the slur, there's not many slurs. This is actually Bieber's handwriting. Here's a slur, okay, here's a slur. There's a couple of slurs here. And then what's really interesting, I'm gonna play just the opening, and then there's gonna be four bars of bass, and then I'm gonna play, here, I'll take this down. The f if this is a piece with a lot of variations. And the first variation is down here. You see it says variation. And then it says aria. This is a song. And when you look at that first, that looks like a march. But this is the trick of reading that notation. So I need to look at this notation and decide, I'm not gonna add slurs to it. I'm not gonna play it spiccato. I'm gonna find out what is going on with this and how I can play it with this instrument. And you'll find all of those things I talked about. The rapid notes, obviously. Um, separate bow legato. You'll hear two bow gestures. And you'll hear all of that stuff. So this is the first half, which by the way, should have a bass line with it. When I did it in the um, recital in June, my husband kindly played the, the bass line on his viola. So you just have to imagine that it's mostly just a, a D that's being held there. But. So this is this half of the beaver enunciation.
rest of that piece goes on. There's another 20 minutes of variations. But that kind of gives you an overview of this. It's late 17th century. It's kind of where Baroque uh, violin language comes from this kind of style and grows out of that. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about so the rules of expression. So Mr. Corette not only gives you these exercises that teach you how to use the bow and how to make your instrument work, he teaches you style. And he has this incredible thing. He has an entire chapter for learning, pour apprendre le jouet du violon dans le goût François, which is to learn French style. And he has a chapter on learning Italian style. And um, you're going to notice there's a big difference the way these sound. I'm going to play a little bit of the French style, and then I'm going to play a little bit of the Italian. And even if you don't read music, look how different it looks on the page. There's a lot less notes. This one, look, here's all these repeated notes. And this is going to sound more instrumental. What this is going to sound is more dance-like. And in fact, the French style um, comes, was really represented by what's going on at Versailles, in the court of Versailles, where Lully is the resident composer and the musician. And it's all dance. You had in every French Baroque opera at the, between the first and second act, there's a lot of dancing, and that's where they did all their recreation. That was kind of a fun opera house. So we talk about the opium clouds during in the, the clouds of opium in the, in the opera house. But anyway, so dance is really important, and these dance styles become templates for the whole century. They persist. And you see these dance things, and all the composers knew what they were and how they worked and where the inflections were. So when you see a minuet in a Haydn symphony, this was well-trained. Minuet's a really important dance. So it all comes out of this French style. So this is 1738, and I'm just gonna give you an example of Corette explaining the difference between French and Italian. Um, use this bow. So here's French. <laughs> and it's kind of where the beginnings of where we had this idea of French overture style. So and you'll notice also I did this funny thing where I swung some of the notes. Again, it's not on the page. That was a convention called inégal, which means unequal. It's essentially exactly what jazz players do. It's not on the page, but they know when those eighth notes should be swung. Now, the next thing here is his version of sort of what Italian style sounds like. And I think you'll notice the difference of how it sounds. And at some point, you should go, oh, is that Vivaldi? <laughs> describing it, we can hear that there's really a difference. And this was really, they were very aware that there were these different national styles, and all composers were aware of them. And every respectable court in Europe would have an Italian musician. But you would also must, part of your training, is to learn all the French dances. <laughs> so there's this, you know, I mean, there's, I always remember that scene. I, they, I think they got that quite right, actually, in Amadeus from years ago, where you had the count sitting there. And, uh, and actually, he was complaining that there were too many notes, too much Italian music. All right, so let's talk about the, I mentioned the minuet. So the minuet's kind of the most common Baroque dance, if you think about it, right? It's in here, what you're looking at is from Suzuki Book One. I love the Suzuki method, by the way. I think it is incredibly brilliant. It's a great way to teach children how to play the violin. But the only, my only reservation is that he, he uses the gold standard material. So he uses a lot of just the greatest music. And sometimes the musical gestures don't mature <laughs> as the playing matures. So anyway, here is, I'm going to try and play it in my best Suzuki language, what I was taught to play as in the first minuet one. So, and he's written, I, for those who are violinists, you can see all of this stuff is showing you fingerings and how to use your bow. So that 
that kind of idea, all right? And if I'm a good student, I play this in tune and correctly. So now, I'm curious, it doesn't really sound like much of a dance. So what did Mr. Corret teach us about minuets? Well, here he has a minuet. And notice he has the, all these TPT. These are French for tire, which is down bow, and P, pousse, for up bow. So look at this for people who are string players. If you're not, it doesn't really make any difference. It won't mean that much to you. But these are the bowings, which are very interesting. And then notice what happens in this measure. That's where we suddenly are going to swing. So I'm going to play the minuet as Mr. Corette taught me. Let me adjust your ears. Let's see. We're in G major. Actually, I learned a lot about French dances from, guess what, a Baroque dancer. And it turns out that like that dance would have been danced by a dancer. And it's really important that you play it right because they get really mad at you if you don't. Because if you put an accent or an inflection on a place where there's on one foot, they fall over. <laughs> so the first thing that you learn about a minuet when you study is that we all thought it was a dance in three. I thought it was a dance in three. It's not a dance in three. It's a dance in six. And that's a minuet is always two bars at a time. And the dancer, and there's a hierarchy in those two bars. So the first beat, which is the first three beats, is the downbeat. One, two, three, up on three. Four is also a downbeat, but it's a false downbeat. So it's not as heavy. And five, six is always lifted. So you would never have, in a minuet, you would never have, you would never have that third beat leading over the bar line from the second to third third bar. So that's a little bit of the structure where the dances are. And so there's this incredible amount of information that is just not on that page. So now the question is, having all that study, can I go back to my Suzuki minuet and play it with that knowledge? So I have to say, when I do that, I do feel like I can move. Whereas I don't feel like I can move when I'm doing that. Okay, so that's what this game is. And now we're going to go to some repertoire. How, how are we doing on time? Okay, good. Um, so we, these dances are really, really important. As I said, they become templates for all the music, a lot of the music in the 18th century. So as violinists, we're very aware, for example, of Bach's six solo sonatas and partitas for unaccompanied violin. The sonatas all have four movements, and they, they kind of pre-show uh, uh, the, the sonata form that we see later in, uh, in sonatas in classical period. But the partitas are dance suites. They're all dances. So these, these pieces are kind of the pinnacle of violin's world, this Bach. Everybody, you just live, you, you don't, go anywhere without your copy of Bach. And what's interesting is that around the beginning of the 20th century, they found Bach's manuscript. I won't play for that. But it looks kind of like this, all right? You can get it. It's in the back of Galamian's edition. This is actually Bach's own handwriting and his notation. Galamian being one of probably over 100 different editors who had edited the entire collection of sonatas. So what was interesting to me is what did the performance practice of this music sound like in the beginning of the 20th century? And we have a lot of additions. And um, so what I've got here is the minuet from the E major, um, from the E major, and the top line here is by Carl Flesch. And what's important about this line is all these funny little markings on top. These are expressive markings, and what these are is these are mirrors of the living performance tradition of the time when Mr. Flesh wrote this music. 
So, but Flesch also had the manuscript, so he was kind enough to put underneath it um, a, re a readable modern version of exactly what Bach wrote, which you notice does not have all of these markings. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to try and do in this attempt is I'm going to play the Flesch version, then I'm going to show what I learned on my Baroque violin, and then go back to my modern violin and see if I can translate that expression onto the other equipment. So I'm back on modern violin, we're in E major. <laughs> to get your ears ready. And this is the minuet, at, according to what Mr. Flesh has showed me on the top of that page. So I'm trying to play it honestly. I'm not trying to sabotage it, but you know. Um, now, let's take my Baroque violin, and now I'm going to be looking at the bottom here. Here's our E major. And I'm going to first of all find my melody. So what did I learn? I learned that it's in six. Can I use all that information I had learned from Mr. Corret and use my Baroque violin? What do I learn? So that's what I learned by playing my Baroque violin, and now can I go back to this instrument? So that's where I've come to at this point in my life. And I've taken that information I have, and that's what I've come up with. Now, there are places where I would prefer, if I get to play this piece in an incredible acoustic, and since it's a solo piece, I don't have other players with me, I truly would prefer, prefer to play it on my Baroque violin. Because that, that, as you do it, and the more you do it, the instrument really talks to you and talks to the room. But anyway, that you don't always get that opportunity. So let's look at some of these other really important dances. Here is, bef before the minuet in that same partita, is the Gavotte in Rondo, very, very famous piece most violinists study. And again, let's look what Mr. Flesch has written to me. He's given me dynamics, he's giving me dots, he's giving me tenudos and um, up bow staccato. So let's see if I can play this as indicated by the top line. This little kind of martelet up bow staccato, I have to say that stroke didn't exist on that instrument really in that way. But it was a, I think actually in many ways it's, it's not a bad solution for with this equipment. So what did we learn about the gavotte? Instead of Mr. Corette, I'm going to look at a different gavotte. This is by another French composer named Tampra. And one of my Baroque dancers teach me about a gavotte that they all, it should be the next handout in there. Um, that the gavotte always starts with these two upbeats, light up bows, upbeats, and then there's a downbeat. And if you play the upbeats louder than the downbeat, you get yelled at because they're jumping. So if you play, here's the gavotte, you know. But if I play, even that difference, stop everything, violinist, you're doing it wrong. So you must learn that these are two upbeats. And oh, look, there's my two bow gesture. Separate bow legato. Repeated notes. Maybe ornaments. And 
another thing I've ended softly, I didn't talk about this before, but another paradigm that you learn when you're studying the violin is that, and we all know and love this, there's this long line that you sustain and then arrive at the cadence. Well, this music, since it's so based on syntax of text, you don't really end, arrive at the end of the sentence. What you're interested in is the harmonic tension. And so when you get to that resolution, that's usually the relaxed part. So and again, so many of these kind of intuitive things that we're taught are kind of standing on their head. So instead of, for example, finishing this dance, which we're thinking we consider that sort of a typical ending, the way I think Mr. Comper would have expected, tense release. Okay, that's just a sidebar. So now going back to our gavotte in E major, I'm going to stick with my Baroque violin, but we're going to E major. And here are my two quarter pickups. So let me see if I can play this with everything I've learned from Mr. Compra. And look at these two bow gestures. Sorry, a lot of tune. Okay. So, taking that, if I go back to this violin. So there's that solution. So let's, okay, that's a gavotte. Now another incredible, I'm just gonna do one or two more dances. The Sarabande, very, very important dance. What I was taught when I was a student, the Sarabandes are very slow, stately dances, and that the characteristic of it is that it has a very accented second beat. So with that information, let me play what Flesh has done. Again, we're looking at this next um, handout. And notice that he showed in these little notes here, he's showing you how to play the chords. He's saying play the bass note before the beat so that you can get to the melody on the beat. So I'm gonna, as best as I can, I'm gonna play this Sarabon a la Mr. Flesh. Well, let's look at another Sarabon. Again, I turn to my Baroque dancers for instruction. Oh no, she says, it's not so slow. The second beat is not accented. What she says, the second beat is special. It might be a little stronger. It could be softer. It could be longer. It could be shorter. Or it could not be anything. The one thing that it should not be is the same. And it's a Sarab also the Sarabon like the minuet, tends to have two bar phrases. So there is a stronger downbeat and a less strong downbeat every other one. And the other thing, the Sarabande, all these dances, the bass line is really important. So the Sarabande, and we'll notice this in the next piece that we look at, the Chaconne, is defined by this bass line. And in this particular example, I'm showing you four parts. So the violin is on top, this bottom line is a cello. So this is the bass line that the cello has. <laughs>
music is kind of, it's hypnotic the way it works. And it's, it's this, um, I call it ear candy in some ways. It's just, and that's partly because of this rhythmic structure. It just gets inside your body. So going back to Bach Sarabande. I'm now going to be looking at this bottom line. Went back to that older handout for this for the live, and let me see if I can at least find the melody from the first few bars here. We're in D minor. So here's my melody. That's my top line. Now what's going on with the bass? Because now, of course, Bach never lets you play just one line. He's making you play the cello part. So we have all of these triple and quadruple stops, which means we have to play chords on, a vi on an instrument which essentially really likes to play linearly. It doesn't like to play chords. We don't think it does. So what are the treatises, and what do they tell us about chords? Well, it turns out that rolling the chord, meaning how we, how we play the notes, is one of the most important expressive devices that you have. And there's a lot of different ways to roll the chord. There is one thing that you must never do, though, and you must never play the bass note before the beat, which is precisely what all of the 20th century has instructed us because they're looking at the melody. Because playing it before the beat, again, let's think of our jazz group or our rock band. Imagine if the bass player is always playing the bass note before the beat. All your favorite pop tunes, it'd be, it's, it wouldn't sound right. So that bass line has to define that harmonic rhythm. And here the bass line. So I'm going to figure out how do I roll these chords. I might play this for you twice to see if I can figure out how to do it. these slurs, like for example in bar five right here, flesh breaks up that slur. But for Bach, he puts them all under one. So it's really important. The most important note in that P, in that measure is this. And the next most important note is this one. So again, it's reading the notation in a way that I hadn't read it before. I went and studied this. So now that I've done that, again, can I translate it to this equipment? Again, let's see if I can get you into the right. The last little dance excerpt that I want to look at is from the great Chaconne. Although, you know what? I think maybe I'm going to skip the Chaconne because I, I want to go to the next thing. So <laughs> we can come back to it at the end a little bit. But what I really want to do is talk about somebody other than Bach and also give an example of what happens with these modern editions and how, so you can see what happens when you translate music into a modern lexicon. So I want us to look now, at, this is a Baroque piece by um, Veracini. And if you can see now, you're looking at the front page and it's piano music. So I'm gonna ask, ask you to play this bit. And I'm gonna have him play, um, this is from a Suzuki recording. 
because I'm going to play this, and then I'm going to play the violin part as it appears in the Suzuki book, which comes in after this great big introduction. And as you're thinking about this, Covericini, this is written probably 1730s, and maybe think about this piano part. So, okay, if you, can, if you don't mind playing this, is the, the piano part to the Vericini. the beginning of this sonata by Veracini. So the first thing you might be thinking about, what's weird about that piano introduction? What would be the, somebody in this room might have an answer, why, why am I questioning that piano introduction? 1730. Do you have any ideas? So when was the piano invented? Okay, so actually it was a Jeopardy question the other day. <laughs> Christopher didn't come up with the first piano until 1700, and it wasn't really even anything like this. This piano that you heard on that recording doesn't come down until about 1860 with an iron frame. So all of that piano music, what is it? Did they make it up? Well, let's look at the original. So that's this next handout. So it looks like all that piano music is actually in the violin part. Here it is. And remember we talked about bass lines. There's a bass line here. So this is the entire piece. So the bass line would have been a bowed bass, a cello playing these notes, and either a, a, a harpsichord or maybe a lute or a theorbo looking at these numbers. Again, like jazz notation, this is figured bass. So the keyboard player sees the E and he sees the six, so he knows it's a C major chord. So he doesn't just play a block C major chord. A great continual player knows, oh, in the C major chord, it might be nice to put just the G, or maybe nothing. But he knows his harmony and just adds and sprinkles the right, correct, good notes that will make this work. But at the same time, you've got this cello giving you rhythm and harmony underlying, because you always need that cello bass line. And what's going on with that huge, giant thing you heard in the piano? Well. This is a kind of stroke and affect that you get with string playing. I, it's a lot, you hear it in Purcell a lot. It's actually incredibly delicate. Uh, Veracini has called this largo, which we know is slow, and staccato, what's the staccato? The staccato, it turns out, refers to these markings here. I don't know if you can see it in the second line for those people um, in, in person. So each 16th note has a little tiny dot over it. And that staccato was represented in Baroque music, which just short notes. Ironically, the piano part had those dots, but the piano's just playing quite long. So what do we think that Veracini meant by this? So let's get, we're going back to our Baroque violin. So the violin starts in the, and again, I'm looking for melody. Where's the melody? That's my melody. Thank you. 
that whole introduction that you're on the piano, which I think what happened is when they saw this, this didn't make, this really did not make any sense to a violin player. It just didn't make that. So this kind of stroke doesn't appear in that kind of style of violin playing in the beginning of the 20th century. So now what's interesting is now here on this, you see the word cantabile, which means singing. This is where the aria starts. In Mr. Suzuki's version, that's where the violin comes in, cantabile. And you saw how I played that. So, but what did, what did Mr. Veracini think? And remember, we've talked about separate bow legato and all that singing stuff. played that other thing when I first played the violin part. But I have to think actually there is a commonality of phrasing. And that's the part of this equation which is myself. So if I go back to my other violin, remember, how did this go? He wanted me to play. Uh, sorry, wrong place. Mr. Veracini. Right, and now I think the other thing that's fun, we had a passage here which was style. With that cadence, nice G major friendly cadence, I think I'd like to end this part, this portion of the demonstration, unless people really want me to go back and do the chicane. And because we've already passed our time, and I think we can go to the Zoom session. Does that seem like a good idea? Right. <laughs> Thank you.